commensurate with the building. So they have to think, well, can I make enough on this new building to pay the extra that my property tax is going to go up to if I build there? Or should I just live, live with this low level property tax in the parking lot, pay 178000 a year, and then sort of collect the uh, imputed income over time as, as uh, the city grows and the demand for land grows. Uh, so what they've obviously chosen to do is leave it as a parking lot. It's been like that for a long time. Um, I live near there, so it's been like that uh, over a decade, I think, even a couple of decades. If, if they do have offers to develop and they reject, then I would understand uh, charging them with, with a tax bill and saying you cannot be denying development opportunities just because you want to save them. Well, that I understand. But if they don't have, then directly going and confiscating it, I don't say confiscate it. But yeah, but if you charge the, 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 the taxes, you jack it up just yeah. like that for no reason, well, that's a we then, then, then you, the, uh, basically you're going to take it from them. Because no, they're no. not going to be able to take the tax. This is what's going on in the no, They're going to have to sell it to somebody who can develop it. They're but, not taking anything. They have to sell it. Because least, we have to use the land efficiently. Or at least just make sure like the taxes on the buildings are low. Because the taxes on buildings are low, <coughs> and that gives them an incentive to look into the building, yeah. right? It should be the same. In other words, it's the same block. You know, so the same location, essentially. So why shouldn't the taxes be the same on per square foot, uh, regardless of what's built on there? That way, you get the best use of the land. And this is the, the Georgia sphere. Uh, so if you if you bring the tax up on the parking lot, uh, then the, you know the owner of the parking lot is going to say, "Hey, wait a minute! I can't pay taxes just by parking cars. I better put up a building, or sell it to somebody who else can put up a building." Uh, so he has a choice. I mean, it's not. It's not like it's going to hit him overnight. He'll know it's coming. So, you know, they'll have some time, uh, maybe a year or so, in which to sell the building or, uh, and so forth. Now, he may not get the price he wants. In fact, he won't. Um, it's true because if, if, again, you know, if the land rent goes up, the price is going to go down. But that's not our problem. You know, what, what the city should really be thinking of is how do you get the best <coughs> revenue and encourage development. And since you can do both at the same time, Simply by raising the land tax, you know, why wouldn't they do it? And we'll, we'll see a little later why they don't do it, but uh, that's the idea. In fact, we'll see pretty soon. Um, all right, so this is a uh, this is what's going to be the, the Western Hemisphere's tallest residential building. It's 100 feet taller than the Empire State Building, and to me it looks very unstable, but I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I wouldn't want to live up there, but apparently a lot of people do because there's billionaires actually buying the apartments on, on top of this building. You're talking about uh, that tower, right? Yeah. So they've got an, an abatement. Uh, they can go 28 feet over this uh, uh, landmark building down here, the Fine Arts Society building. And uh, they also are going up uh, 200, and, uh, this is 215 less than the 7th actually, so this is not even... Uh, most expensive building, but it's one of them. So this is Extel Corporation, and they're uh, taking you know the space that's going to be 100 feet taller than the Empire State Building, and we'll see uh, in a little bit uh, why they're able to get away with this sort of thing. But it's basically because they're undertaxed on their land, and they've got special deals uh, with the, uh, the legislature and the Senate and the, and the Assembly, uh, where they basically have these uh, huge tax abatements. So therefore. Again, the land rent is down, so the land price is up, so the only people who can afford that, that price, which translates into the price of the apartment, are millionaires and billionaires, and those are the people who are buying in this building. Um, and a lot of them don't live here, too. So let me uh, continue on a little bit. And speaking of air rights, uh, this sort of thing is becoming quite common now, where buildings will come up and they'll pay the building next door, uh, some sort of rent to basically rent the space above the building and air rights. Um, so here you have a case of new building going up and you can see the overhang on these two older buildings plus the vacant lot. You can see on the corner here is actually a lot between the two older buildings and that building on the far corner. Um, so there's three lots there. And what's happening here, you know, looking at the chart again, uh, you've got uh, these two little buildings uh, with a, with a vacant lot, so three of them together have 11, uh, or 13 units rather, and the building next door on the far corner has uh, 95 units, 
uh, but the uh, the uh, building uh, with the 11 the properties with the 13 units are actually paying 14 percent of the property tax of the uh, 95 story building per square foot so uh, the better utilized property is uh, paying uh, 800 and, uh, 855,000 uh, a year on the uh, vacant and the underutilized property is paying only 164,000 a year uh, in taxes, uh, or 19% uh, even though they've got, well that's about right, it's 14% number of units uh, and 19% of taxes, so I guess you could think of it as progressive that way, but, but it's really not fair. It, it means that these, these little uh, tiny buildings plus a vacant lot are vastly underpaying uh, for the land uh, rent uh, as compared to the building on the corner, and probably as compared to this new building that's going up, but I don't know, I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, they actually uh, are a pretty comparable land, the 13 unit space with the vacant lot is taking 71% of the land of the corner building, so it's, uh, you know, it's roughly equivalent, but they're paying far less than the taxes. Okay. Um, now, another thing that happens is that uh, parks uh, add to real estate values. So we've got this Highline Park, and uh, Michael Bloomberg said that this Highline Park put in $2 billion in private investment surrounding that park, and he said it makes up for the $115 million the city has spent on the park, and deals that it's made to encourage developers uh, to, uh, to build. Um, but the price of the apartments near the park is uh, $2,000 a square foot. So, again, you know, this is only going to go to rich folks because the price is so high. Uh, in the meantime, the city is paying for the park. So the real question is, why is the city spending money to benefit a handful of already rich owners when charging them the land value tax, which is really a rent on the land, but it brought in enough to build the park in the first place? And the second question is, because this park was built with charity, is it really charity when landowners give a million dollars to build a park and when they gain tens of millions when they sell their land? Or isn't that just another investment at taxpayer expense? In other words, they put a little bit in, they get this great park, uh, but then when they sell their land, they make it back in space. You know, they may make 10, 20 times because of the park, because of the great you know, improvement that that uh, brings to the value of their land. So. You know, you have to watch these, these so-called charities and who's really benefiting. Um, here's another thing in that same neighborhood. Uh, so here we're, we're seeing a number seven train extension going out to Hudson Yards. And this, uh, according to the uh, uh, Curve magazine, uh, is turning this into a big uh, boom town. As a matter of fact, I met the builder uh, who was building that uh, Hudson Yards project. His company is doing a $20 billion project. And uh, it's the biggest project his company has done, I think the biggest project in, in the country in history. Uh, yeah, that's what he said. So it's a $20 billion project to build Hudson Yards. Um, obviously, it's bringing huge revenues. So they're saying that the 5,000, according to New York Times, the 5,000 apartments that have already been built have brought $5 billion in private development um, that has been invested in that area between 28th and 43rd Street, uh, west of 8th Avenue. Uh, since it was rezoned in 2005. So the question is, why do the developers need tax breaks if they're going to make so much money? Uh, and who is going to pay for the subway extension? Well, according to Cranes Magazine, the Economic Development Industrial Development Agency is expected to clear a big tax break, a big tax discount for a portion of the related company's vast Hudson Yards project. It's a 20 year long, 40% property tax break for a 1 million square foot mall and 2.4 million square foot office fire. And a related company could make, could realize 328 million in savings from the exemption. So they're getting this big exemption. Fiscal watchdogs say that the break is especially problematic given that the city plans to use tax revenue from the Hudson Yards to pay off the over $2 billion cost of extending the number seven line uh, to the site. So between 2006 and 2012, the city spent $137 million servicing the bonds for the number seven line that we have to pay interest, and girding itself to spend $155.6 uh, million in 2013-2014. Um, so, again, the city is spending all this money to build in Hudson Yards, uh, to build a subway station going to Hudson Yards, and the uh, developers are basically uh, getting a, a rebate. Uh, so that they say they won't build without it. 
Uh, and then it's turning out that the land price is going up because, again, the property tax is so low that the price of the apartments goes up correspondingly, um, so that the, the city is also losing revenue again. And this is a huge project now. It's, it's one thing if you do Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's here and there, but this is uh, you know billions of dollars just over time. So we're losing a lot of money. Um, now, the same thing happens when you increase uh, transportation by water. After all, we're an island uh, city. Uh, so we now have an East River Ferry that uh, has caused total property values in Brooklyn and Queens waterfront neighborhoods <laughs> to soar by hundreds of millions of dollars, according to a new study. The service, which launched in 2011, led to a jump in home values within an eighth of a mile of its stops by 8% above the normal market rate, according to an analysis by EDC. And it has increased total property value by half a billion dollars for all homes within a mile of its stops. And this uh, broker said, you really see the connection in the uptake in, in sales prices. Uh, this broker from Douglas Elliman said, it's a huge draw for river communities. She added the ferry is a boost for luring Manhattanites across the river. I'm sure it is. So this is a great amenity. People are willing to pay for it. But the people that they're paying are not the people who run the ferry. So the city is running it. They're charging the riders. The ferry is also getting a subsidy from general revenue. Uh, but the residents, uh, well, they take the ferry, they're paying. But the ones who own the land, they don't pay anything extra for it. You know, they may pay eventually a little bit more in property tax in general, but it's not going into this, this service. Uh, so, you know, the ferry is struggling. They have to keep asking for subsidies. They can't make it on the fares from the riders. So the question is, why shouldn't the landowner who benefits also pay for some of that? Okay. So now we're going to have global warming, perhaps. I mean, that seems to be what's happening. And I, I ride around the city on my bike a lot. And when there's a high tide, it looks like the river is only like two or three feet below the uh, surface. So it seems like that's uh, what's going to happen. So as the temperatures continue to rise, so will sea levels, and the increase uh, will cause uh, you know more storm tides, like we have with Hurricane Sandy. So according to New York City Panel of Climate Change, our sea level is expected to rise between 15 and 75 inches by 2100. Rising seas dramatically increase the odds of damaging floods from the storm tide. And we've seen that. So the city is planning to build this elevated multi-purpose levee in Lower Manhattan, and you can kind of see that this is a little bit higher than the end on that side, so it's angled upward. Uh, so that's supposed to uh, protect this like a, a levee, uh, and they're going to build upon it. So the question is, if the landowner gains from newly created land uh, when he builds on it, shouldn't he pay rent to maintain and create that land? Um, Yet, President Obama has actually signed an order to roll back the national flood insurance rate hikes uh, that would have paid for repair in case of storms uh, that were put in place after Hurricane Sandy. So who gains from that? That means that basically uh, the government is underwriting the uh, insurance uh, rates and uh, the, the private owner is not paying the, the, what they should be paying for the dangerous area. Um, so is that fair? Is it fair for the government, which means us the taxpayers, to pay for uh, developers to build on a uh, hazardous area or to uh, ameliorate that by building these levees so that it's not so hazardous. Um, so that's another way that the uh, uh, private interests are gaining at the public expense. Um, all right, now you also have uh, something called leaseholds, and these are long-term leases on land, and uh, they can be decades long. So it, it's almost as if uh, you own the land, but eventually the lease will run out and have renew, but but still, if it's uh, early enough, uh, you can make a lot of money as, as if you were the owner. So Extel Corporation, again, Extel Development, we've heard about them. Uh, they're selling the leasehold on 20 East 46th Street. Uh, so the company's brokers say they hope to fetch about $25 million for the 15-story property that's on that lease. That would be 44% more than Extel shelled out when it acquired the leasehold in 2006 for $17.4 million. Uh, the lease for the building extends for 31 years, and if the building is in a great location, well, that's what according to Cranes, I'm sure it is. Um, so the tax rate is supposedly 10.3%, uh, but this is on a market value. Um, actually, it's not on a market value. The market value, according to the city, is almost 20 million, but see, they're trying to get 25. And the assessed value, uh, which is really what the tax is based, based on, is only 7,249,000. And the land is supposedly uh, three and a half million. 
so everything again is under assessed by millions of dollars, uh, which means that the tax, so whatever the rate is, it's not uh, really collecting what it ought to be collecting. Uh, so here again is another property where the city is losing millions of dollars over time. Um, so now let's go one more time with Extel Corporation. Uh, why would anybody pay over $90 million for an apartment? This is what they're, they've sold the top uh, penthouse for. Uh, Extel Development Company, which is building 157, said that the buyers of the first nine full, full floor apartments plus two duplex penthouses were all billionaires. So that means 11 billionaires all living together. Um, uh, the top floor penthouse, which spans nearly 11,000 square feet, sold for about $95 million. It's to be record. The full floor apartments have open views of Central Park. And, and by the way, you should go online and take a virtual tour. It's, it's like looking at a little globe, you know, one of those snow globes. Um, but people do want to live up there. Uh, so high-end uh, real estate has become a magnet for the world's super rich who are looking for better investment returns and a safe haven from thornier <coughs> economic conditions in their home countries. A lot of what's happening at 157 is about wealth preservation. And that may be a little hard to imagine when you're spending $95 million that you're trying to preserve your wealth, but they have their reasons. And, and the reasons have to go back to the taxes again. So places like 157, 15 Central Park West, the Plaza Hotel, or another uh, uh, New York entirely, one for the ultra-wealthy with a primary residence else, elsewhere, for whom a $55 million condo is to be to tear, and just another place to park their wealth. Uh, Mayor de Blasio's proposal will have little of any effect on them. They pay no city income tax, because many of them are foreign, and comparatively low property taxes, even as the city services prop up the value of their trophy real estate. And how low is it? Well, there was an article that just came out in New York Magazine called Stash Pad, it's a cover story. And they said in New York, and I'm talking about 157 again, by contrast, to foreign cities like London, which now taxes foreign investors and offshore entities, uh, buyers of new construction often qualify for a tax abatement. So at 157, currently the city's most expensive new address, the tax amounts to 94, the tax abatement amounts to 94 percent. So this means that a Times analysis estimated that the priciest printhouse, that's the one that sold for more than 90 million dollars, 95 million would initially be billed at less than $1,500 a month. So try, to, try to imagine this now. You're, you're living in a $95 million uh, apartment, and you're paying something like half, or maybe a little more than half, of what the average New Yorker pays in rent, or common charges. I mean, it's, it boggles the mind. And, and so this is why, you know, this is the most dramatic example I have, really, why when the land rent goes down, the price goes way up. It goes up to the moon in this case. And so, you know, they got this enormous abatement, basically no tax at all. So they don't have to charge their tenants very much for property taxes, so it's 1500 a month. So, you know, why wouldn't you come here if you're uh, uh, from Russia or China and you're worried about the security of your money, you stash them here, and that's why they call this stash pad. Um, so. so this is uh, the tax breaks for billionaires. Does anybody want to read this and uh, give me a speaking break, or should I keep on reading? Okay. Any volunteers? I have to keep reading. Okay. <laughs> uh, the millionaires buying apartments in a soaring tower rising on 57th Street, again 157, are getting more than sweeping views of Central Park. They'll also be eligible for massive city tax breaks. So will the homeowners and builders of four other luxury Manhattan condo and rental developments, language quietly slipped into a bill, and this is how it happens, that sailed through the state legislature, singled out the five developments to make them eligible for tax breaks, which could cost the city tens of millions of dollars in property taxes. Well, we're talking about one year, it's actually going to be more than that year after year. The sponsor of the bill, Senator Martin Golden, a Republican in Brooklyn, defended the tax breaks, saying the projects would create jobs and boost the economy. And the assembly sponsor, Rest, but past both houses. Keith Wright uh, said that uh, he knew little about the tax breaks, these five properties. It was important that they benefit from the piece of legislation, probably. And I don't know why, because some of the folks in the Senate, going back to Bolden, wanted them to be included. 
So this, that was in the Daily News, uh, talking about the newly designated billionaire's role, um, as according to the New York Times. Um, so one of our uh, representatives, uh, Linda Rosenthal on the Upper West Side, she said that uh, these buildings will make a lot of money for developers, and that's right, that's their right, about that. but we need something back. Um, so I have actually met with her, uh, with some of my uh, colleagues at Common Ground, and we talked to her about this, but I guess she's not quite got the message yet, or she doesn't have the power to do anything about it. Yeah. What is the what is the something back that she well yeah she we want to, we want to have to <laughs> exactly so that's that's the point something back yeah well when we get to the end of this we'll see what we can do about that uh, yeah. so it's a yeah question. yeah um, uh, you mentioned that some congresswoman said that Linda Rosenthal uh, yeah who Linda Rosenthal Linda Rosenthal said that they will uh, create jobs. Has the actually, uh, that was the sponsor of the bill, uh, Keith Wright, I think. Okay, but has has that create jobs? I have to understand the building, building the building, and building the building, and, and then it's all in the building and maintaining it. And maintaining it. But maintaining is a very small thing. I mean, how many do you need? I mean, how big do they make? Maintenance for it. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think you know the jobs that are created don't offset the loss of the tax revenues that could go to the city and potentially. Uh, enable opportunities for other jobs. Um, yeah. yeah, it's also interesting what this gentleman said. They simply blackmail the public by saying so called jobs are going to be created. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Sunset Park, where there's been a tremendous building boom, yeah. most of those construction jobs are non union. Most of the maintenance jobs within these buildings are non union. Right. So, what's being created? Dead end, medium, low paying jobs. Yeah. So, you know, this is why the city is, is getting bifurcated and the middle class is getting squeezed oh. out. These are not middle class jobs, these are low paying jobs, uh, service jobs. And, uh, and you know, basically you've got foreign ownership, maybe they're here two or three months a year. They don't pay in much sales tax because they're not here. Uh, they're not paying any income tax because they don't make income tax, income here. Uh, so, you know, yes, they're paying a little bit of, uh, of property tax, but it's tiny. Uh, so basically what they're doing is enriching the developer. They, they paid $95 million or $90 million for an apartment. So it's going to the developer and the developer's not paying the uh, property tax. So they're pocketing it. Um, so it's a one heck of a deal. It's, <laughs> and my, it's, and my, it's, a, it's a landlord's game after all. Yeah. But they, but they call it capitalism. Well, it's uh, some it's a landlord's game. Yeah. Do, do you think somebody's going to pull a so-called middle class guy? Uh, back in 94, remember when the state wanted to do away with rent stabilization, when Pataki was governor, it united all the classes in demonstrations they finally kept rent control and rent stabilization in New York. Yeah. I, I don't think people realize what's really going on. You know, people are... But they did in 94. Maybe they were smarter, but I don't think they realize this kind of extreme uh, favoritism toward a certain development.